I had was, isn't that the most beautiful way to describe finding what you're meant to do? A calling? And I love that because it's so intended and it's a message that you are supposed to receive. Sometimes a calling is like a trumpet and sometimes a calling can be a whisper. But no matter what, your calling, especially in the life of a teacher, is a moment that you remember forever. And I remember mine as clear as day. You've all heard stories about teachers who played school when they were little. I really was that little girl. And so I would have all of my stuffed animals all lined up and I had a whiteboard and magnetic letter tiles. And then I got the best present ever, which was a baby brother. <laughs> and I thought, yes, I have a student. And I would watch my teachers at school and really see what they were doing. And I would race home and I would grab Aaron and I would teach. And I'm very proud to tell you that by the time Aaron was four, he could read. And it was the foot book. You know that one by Dr. Seuss? And I remember that night when he turned the pages and he pointed at every single word and he read them. And I thought, oh my gosh, he is so smart. I am awesome. <laughs> and I knew I wanted to do this forever. I have to start my speech though there and let you know as an educator, I had read him the foot book like every single night. So the chances of him reading that, he probably wasn't. He probably memorized it. But to me, I thought it was wonderful. And that's where my calling began. But it certainly is not where my calling stayed. Because over time, my calling has been refined into something that is much more forceful and more compelling, a need to teach. At the heart of everything that we do is our students. So I thought I'd introduce you to some of mine. This picture, my class is doing a tableau, which is a, you know, um, like a living sculpture of a chapter from Sarah Plain and Tall. And we talk a lot about the different levels you should have and what your character is thinking, being really expressive with your eyes because you don't get to say a word, which is great for our EL students who can now cooperate and collaborate and have a way to express too. I was talking to the two that are up on top, kind of battening down the hatches. And while I was talking to them, the little girl on the right who's a wall, I hear her say it to the little boy across from her who's the other wall, do you think we should smile? And the little boy said, why? And then she said, I don't know, because we're a happy home. And it's that kind of thought. This picture is really important too. This is the part of the book where Sarah and the kids are out in the barn going down a sand dune, which is a haystack. And in this case, it's my podium. And the little boy who's sitting on top of the podium, who's so expressive, did not talk to me for the first two months of school. He didn't talk to anyone. He is completely at level with reading and math, but he is so insecure about his English, even though it's beautiful, that he wouldn't talk to anyone until this day, where he volunteered to be Caleb riding on top of the haystack. And he was so expressive. And the kids all agreed he was the best one. And we clapped, and as they walked away, this little guy came to me right beside me, and for the first time all year in November said, Miss Bouzois, that was awesome. And it really was. This is my class, and they're not all here because we, you know, we got some of the flu <laughs> some of those days. <laughs> But I promise, I did not tell them to pose this way. All I said was, could you guys get together because I can't fit you all in. And right away, their arms came out and they're just holding on to each other. And that's exactly who this class is. They are tight and they will take up for each other in a moment's notice and defend each other and they are the best of friends. There are two little people in this picture who speak absolutely no English at all. One who does speak a little and then the others are all in um, ESL and being monitored. It's really important for us to know that for the majority of the students in this picture, if they were in their homeland, they would not be attending school because of many reasons. And first is that it's too dangerous or it's too expensive or because they're a girl. Teaching my y'all students is something that I am very proud of and something that's very close to my heart because I know what a good teacher can do for an EL student. Because that was my dad. I'm the daughter of an EL student. My family came from Holland, and in 1948, after the war and being ravaged by everything, my grandpa and grandma decided they were leaving. 
and they came to the United States, and they settled in South Dakota. I grew up in a house where all of my aunts and uncles and my dad, we would sit around Baba's table, Baba's grandma in Dutch, but we would sit around her table and they would speak Dutch a mile a minute. And you heard wonderful things like, oh, Erika, you're so mooi, Famke, which is, Erika, you're such a nice girl. <laughs> All the way to, Erika, hadi still, which means, Erika, be quiet. <laughs> and I just kind of thought that that's how it was at everybody's house. Well, my dad was just like the students in this picture and in my classroom. He did not speak any English. He didn't read English. He could not write in English. And then he was sent to school. And to start, it was a country school. Now at the country school, they really didn't know how to help him. So their only real plan was to hold him back, just in the hopes that he would pick up the language on his own. And eventually, the country school was closed. And my dad was sent to Woolsey School, and it was there that he met a teacher. And her name is Fran Muchkinhouse. Now when I say that name to you, it probably doesn't mean anything, but when you go to Woolsey and say that name, you will see people smile and hear them laugh or maybe even cry, and that is how much power that little woman had. And she saw something in my father. She saw that he was bright and that he was a quick learner and that he had a real talent for basketball. And so she went to my grandpa Anno and asked if she could tutor him in the morning and then take him home after school so he could be on the team. And of course, my grandparents said no, but she did not give up. She went back again and again until she finally wore down my grandpa Anno, and he said yes. And that is the moment where everything changed for my dad. He caught up to the rest of his classmates, and he learned English, and he set the scoring record for the most points in a basketball game in Woolsey. I was supposed to tell you that. He said, make sure you let them know. <laughs> like, I will. He was up for Mr. All-American, but most importantly, my dad is the first one out of all of us to ever go to college on a full-ride basketball scholarship. And when he got there, do you know what he signed up to be? A teacher. And I asked him, why did you do that? And he said, Erica, I don't know if I would be who I am if it weren't for mine. And he is right. You see, the difference was a teacher. My grandparents were wonderful people, but let's be honest, they were just trying to survive. It took a teacher to see that other side of life, that side of life beyond survival, a side of life that's full of potential and opportunity. And it took a teacher to open her heart and her arms as wide as she could and help as much as she could because she believed in his potential. And I know that we're responsible for teaching content and standards, but we are called to do so much more and that's to be our students' dreamers and to be their visionaries and to paint a picture of life for our students that they don't even know they should dream for themselves. And in some cases, don't even know they deserve. And it doesn't end with them. It moves into their family and changes their family as well. And I'm reminded of that all the time. We just had conferences last week and I was sitting across from um, a man He's really a big guy, and I felt sorry for him because my fourth grade chairs are little. <laughs> he's about 6'6", six, six, and he's from Somalia, and I was talking to him about his son. His son, you would love. His son is an exuberant learner. He came to class below level, EL student, but every moment is a moment to learn for him, and he's excited by every mistake because he'll say, we do a lot of social-emotional learning in the room. My dendrites are growing. I know I didn't get it right, but I will. And he always has a feeling. It's always a feeling with him. So it'll be math class, and he'll come up with a story prompt and be like, Ms. Boomswa, I feel like I should multiply. And I would be like, you're right. You should. And he'd be like, yes. High five. Yeah. He's great. And for the first time ever, he has made grade level in reading. And I'm telling his father about all the hard work his son does. What a wonderful student he is. And this man, who is so tall and such a big guy, with eyes brimming with tears of joy, and in very broken English said these words, thank you, teacher. It's like my son's eyes were asleep, but now he's awake. And I had a conference the next night with a family from Guatemala. Their child is also just the best. He's a little different from the other one. He's not so expressive with feelings. He likes to use every single word that you've taught him all the time. 
So if he has a question, he'll come up and say, Ms. Bones, I'm sorry for the confusion. He really does talk like this. I'm sorry for the confusion, but according to my calculations, this sum should be correct. <laughs> and I'm telling his family about, wow, this child, I wish you could meet them because you would adore them instantly. How smart he is. And for the first time ever, has surpassed grade level in reading and in math and will exit ESL. I looked at the little boy and I said, you know, it's time for you to start thinking about what you want to do with your life. You can be a doctor, you could be an engineer, you could be a teacher. I said, you can do anything. And it was at that moment that his father said to me, you know, I didn't finish fourth grade. I had to go to work. And then he put his rough hand on his son's shoulder and looked at him with so much pride and said, but look at my son. He can have everything. And what I saw there was a father who had spent his whole childhood surviving, but had paved a way for his own son to follow his dreams. And when you have a moment like that, your calling is changed forever. And you are reminded about why you teach and what an education truly means. And you're re-energized to go out and to do as much as you possibly can because for some of the families of these students in this picture, they have moved hell and high water to get here and you are determined not to let them down. And I feel sorry for people who have lost touch with that and who just chase fleeting test scores or worry only about where they rank because they've lost the meaning of what a true education is. But you haven't. You know that we're called for a higher purpose than that. And we're called to bring light into lives and to make this world a better place. We're called to be dynamic and we're called to be strong, but we're also called to be kind and to take care of one another. And at a time where there is so much negativity and so much hate, that is a message that everyone needs to hear. And who better to lead the way than us, the teachers from the heart of the nation, the teachers who come from a state whose name means friend. A calling is powerful. An entire world will be changed because good men and women follow what they're meant to do. And not for money, and not for themselves, but for the good of others. So cherish your calling, that spirit of clarity and hope, and hold on to it. Think of it often and follow it every single day because it's the greatest gift that you have been given. It's your guide, and it's your direction toward who you're meant to be. Thank you so much for all your time and all the efforts that you pour into your students. You are the reason that your students are growing and you are the reason that they are finding success. You are the reason that their futures are bright. It's all because of you and you make all the difference.